Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum and welcome to the Wednesday edition of Let's Talk with me, Julie Ali. We're coming to you live from our Sunning Hill studios right here in Johannesburg. And on the show today, we'll be talking with Dr. Neil Batko. And of course, we're going to be talking COVID-19. And I wonder if life is ever going to be the same again post the 21 days. We're going into lockdown tomorrow night at um, 12 o'clock, midnight tomorrow night. The whole of South Africa goes into lockdown. Only essential personnel will be expected to report for duty. So we're talking people like medical staff, um, certain bus utility companies, certain food chain stores, um, production, uh, fruit, major food producers. So all of those uh, trucks will be on the road. And obviously um, anything and everything that is deemed as essential services. Now I have a lot of questions in terms of when you talk lockdown, let's look at other parts of the world. And I'm not sure whether I have in fact picked up on it or not. I understand that even our parks are on lockdown. So what about those people who are joggers, who are runners, uh, people who are professional athletes and need to keep fit? And let's assume they live in very tiny homes with possibly no gardens or are even holed up in tiny flats. What sort of outcome you know, is or what sort of accommodations are being made for people like them. And if you are a person who is very health conscious and would like to go out into the open to do your jog, your run, your walk, perhaps your, your, your animals need to be taken for a walk on a daily basis as well. What happens in those circumstances under those conditions? Are you going to be stopped? Is SAND, um, the South African Defence Force, going to be patrolling suburbs as well? Or are they only going to be on the major highways? What sort of leeway will that then allow ordinary citizens in the suburbs uh, in terms of access? Now, I also understand that um, supermarkets and certain food stores will be open. And good, um, you know, we, we're very thankful for that because it will enable us to top up on our food um, uh, provisions, our food stores in the home. And I mean, it was rather frightening to see the crazy queues, the panic buying happening at supermarkets, macro stores, butchers, and all stores in general. What I did yesterday was when I did a bit of shopping, and it wasn't panic buying, I can assure you that, I just needed a few provisions for the house. And the moment I walked into a store where there were very, very long queues, I took a U-turn and I walked out, simply because I don't have the patience to, to stand in long queues. But also I was worried people were crammed together. There was no distancing of a meter or longer. And I kind of thought to myself, we're going into lockdown for 21 days, but what are these people doing? What are they thinking? They jam-packed into these stores. They absolutely jam-packed next to each other in queues. And what are they exposing themselves to? Do they even know if one of them perhaps are carriers? So those are all the thoughts that went through my mind. And unfortunately, I don't have anyone from government in studio to come and talk about these issues. But I have no doubt in my mind that this type of communication is overdue and will be disseminated to all and sundry in due course, possibly over the past day or two. So those are the kind of things that's going on in my mind. And one other thing I'm thinking as well, if you're one of those people that absolutely has to have fresh bread and needs to buy maybe a liter of milk every day, you may not have the space in your fridge or your freezer. And if you go on a daily basis 
to your local supermarket, which might be about two kilometers away, what happens then? Are you breaking some form of curfew? Are you going to be in trouble with the law? So those are things we need to think about. And hopefully there is a government line somewhere along the line where you could call and pose those questions to. I think at the end of all of this, after the 21 days, two things are going to happen. We, well, number one, we're never going to be the same again. again. And inshallah, after the 21 days, they say that it takes 21 days to break a bad habit and inculcate a new good habit. So let's hope after the 21 days, we are more circumspect about our own health issues, that the relationships we formed with our loved ones, inshallah, will continue on an even keel. That we work hard at getting things right with our loved ones. And this is an opportunity to come out at the top after the 21 days. But I'm going to end on this thought before we go for an ad break. And that is, what if the curve does not flatten? What if that curve is not flattened? Government hasn't told us what happens in that situation. Does that mean that a further curfew is going to be imposed? I'm talking about it as a curfew, but of course the terminology is lockdown. Does that mean that the lockdown gets um, lengthened? D does it get rolled over for another 15 days, another 10 days, another month, another two months? How's that going to impact on us as human beings, being holed up with people in our family, two, three, ten, however many members you have in your family. And it doesn't matter how big your home may be, eventually you're going to feel very confined. Eventually you're going to start suffering from something called cabin fever. So has government started thinking along those lines? We make dua, inshallah, that the 21 days will be enough for the curve to flatten here in South Africa, that we won't have this threat, that the disease will be contained, that in the interim, inshallah, a vaccine will have, you know, will be developed and be available for all of us. But what if that doesn't happen? We need to put some form of contingency in place. And I'm not trying to be negative on this issue. It's things I've been thinking about. Alhamdulillah, last week we had, Shab uh, not Shabir, we had Imran Banubai in studio with us, talking to us about um, being spiritually prepared and embracing the 21 days of lockdown. How we can truly become more spiritual tap into our spirituality and become stronger human beings. Later on in the show with Neil Butko, Dr. Neil Butko, we're going to talk about the psychological and mental aspects of a lockdown, the impact it has on the human psyche, how we need to prepare for this, how we need to contain ourselves, how we need to interact with our loved ones. So all of that is what Hopefully we're going to unpack, but I leave you with one more thought, which I'm not going to be raising in the interviews this morning, but something that's been playing on my mind. We're talking about lockdown, all good and well. Hopefully the curve will flatten. What about people in squatter camps? Did you even, did you see what squatter camps look like? And I don't think any South African doesn't know what the conditions are like in squatter camps. You are absolutely back to back with your neighbor. You're living in very informal makeshift structures. You have plastic sheeting that protects you from the rain. 
You have zinc as your roof and your walls. And there's not only one or two people living in squatter camps in a shack. You have entire families living there, from toddlers to old people. And if you look at, look at Orange Farm, for an example, the moment there's a fire or there's, um, you know, if we have thunderstorms, what happens in those areas? Disaster relief has to kick in. So has government given some thought to residents of squatter camps? I've heard that they are going to relocate the people. Relocate the people to where? Are you not creating another squatter camp condition? And how are you going to create or make people aware of the importance of social distancing? And even in your own families and even in your own homes with your loved ones, you know, we are told, try and remain at least a meter apart from each other. Very especially if one of them have uh, symptoms of a cough, a sneeze, a cold, the flu, whatever it is. What happens to the people in squatter camps? Are we sitting on a time bomb here? Something to think about. What about people? We know there's a vast majority of South African citizens, sadly, who suffer from TB and who are suffering from HIV. It may not be positive, but they are, you know, they do have HIV. What about them? What if the curve is not flattened? What sort of wipeout are we looking at as far as our population is concerned? You just need to look at one of the richest countries in the world, one of the richest nations in the world, the USA. They are in panic mode at the moment because their COVID-19 uh, cases have dramatically risen overnight and even the death rate. So all I ask is my fellow South Africans, put your hands together. Pray very, very hard that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes us through this. Let's make dua inshallah that in these 21 days, we all adhere and we are able to flatten the curve. So I've given you lots to think about and all I ask is let's join hands, all of us as South Africans, the Rainbow Nation, and let's ask the Almighty, let's besiege him, let, let's plead with him to let us get through these 21 days and all will be well again, inshallah. Welcome back. And we here at ITV are doing our responsibility bit in terms of bringing as much COVID-19 and coronavirus information to you as we possibly can. We do hope you're sitting up and taking note. And this is serious. This is truly serious business. Please, people, just exercise the necessary restraint so that we can collectively flatten the curve. Let's take a look at a clip from the World Health Organization explaining COVID-19 or coronavirus. In December 2019, the Chinese authorities notified the world that a virus was spreading through their communities. In the following months, it spread to other countries with cases doubling within days. This virus is the severe acute respiratory syndrome related coronavirus 2 that causes the disease called COVID-19 and that everyone simply calls coronavirus. What actually happens when it infects a human and what should we all do? A virus is really just a hull around genetic material and a few proteins, arguably not even a living thing. It can only make more of itself by entering a living cell. Corona may spread via surfaces, but it's still uncertain how long it can survive on them. Its main way of spreading seems to be droplet infection, when people cough or if you touch someone who's ill and then your face, say rubbing your eyes or nose. 
The virus starts its journey here and then hitches a ride as a stowaway deeper into the body. Its destinations are the intestines, the spleen or the lungs, where it can have the most dramatic effect. Even just a few coronaviruses can cause quite a dramatic situation. The lungs are lined with billions of epithelial cells. These are the border cells of your body, lining your organs and mucosa, waiting to be infected. Corona connects to a specific receptor on its victim's membranes to inject its genetic material. The cell, ignorant of what's happening, executes the new instructions, which are pretty simple, copy and reassemble. It fills up with more and more copies of the original virus until it reaches a critical point and receives one final order, self-destruct. The cell sort of melts away, releasing new corona particles, ready to attack more cells. The number of infected cells grows exponentially. After about 10 days, millions of body cells are infected and billions of viruses swarm the lungs. The virus has not caused too much damage yet, but Corona is now going to release a real beast on you, your own immune system. The immune system, while there to protect you, can actually be pretty dangerous to yourself and needs tight regulation. And as immune cells pour into the lungs to fight the virus, Corona infects some of them and creates confusion. Cells have neither ears nor eyes, they communicate mostly via tiny information proteins called cytokines. Nearly every important immune reaction is controlled by them. Corona causes infected immune cells to overreact and yell bloody murder. In a sense, it puts the immune system into a fighting frenzy and sends way more soldiers than it should, wasting its resources and causing damage. Two kinds of cells in particular wreak havoc. First, neutrophiles, which are great at killing stuff, including ourselves. As they arrive in their thousands, they start pumping out enzymes that destroy as many friends as enemies. The other important type of cells that go into a frenzy are killer T-cells, which usually order infected cells to commit controlled suicide. Confused as they are, they start ordering healthy cells to kill themselves too. The more and more immune cells arrive, the more damage they do and the more healthy lung tissue they kill. This might get so bad that it can cause permanent irreversible damage that leads to lifelong disabilities. In most cases, the immune system slowly regains control. It kills the infected cells, intercepts the viruses trying to infect new ones and cleans up the battlefield. Recovery begins. The majority of people infected by corona will get through it with relatively mild symptoms. But many cases become severe or even critical. We don't know the percentage because not all cases have been identified, but it's safe to say that there is a lot more than with the flu. In more severe cases, millions of epithelial cells have died and with them, the lung's protective lining is gone. That means that the alveoli, tiny air sacs via which breathing occurs, can be infected by bacteria that aren't usually a big problem. Patients get pneumonia, respiration becomes hard or even fails, and patients need ventilators to survive. The immune system has fought at full capacity for weeks and made millions of antiviral weapons. And as thousands of bacteria rapidly multiply, it is overwhelmed. They enter the blood and overrun the body. If this happens, death is very likely. The coronavirus is often compared to the flu, but actually, it's much more dangerous. While the exact death rate is hard to pin down during an ongoing pandemic, we know for sure that it's much more contagious and spreads faster than the flu. There are two futures for a pandemic like corona, fast and slow. Which future we will see depends on how we all react to it in the early days of the outbreak. A fast pandemic will be horrible and cost many lives. A slow pandemic will not be remembered by the history books. The worst case scenario for a fast pandemic begins with a very rapid rate of infection because there are no countermeasures in place to slow it down. Why is this so bad? In a fast pandemic, many people get sick at the same time. If the numbers get too large, healthcare systems become unable to handle it. There aren't enough resources like medical staff or equipment like ventilators left to help everybody. People will die untreated. And as more healthcare workers get sick themselves, the capacity of healthcare systems falls even further. If this becomes the case, then horrible decisions will have to be made about who gets to live and who doesn't. The number of deaths rises significantly in such a scenario. 
To avoid this, the world, that means all of us, needs to do what it can to turn this into a slow pandemic. A pandemic is slowed down by the right responses, especially in the early phase, so that everyone who gets sick can get treatment and there's no crunch point with overwhelmed hospitals. Since we don't have a vaccine for corona, we have to socially engineer our behavior to act like a social vaccine. This simply means two things. Not getting infected and not infecting others. Although it sounds trivial, the very best thing you can do is to wash your hands. Soap is actually a powerful tool. The coronavirus is encased in what is basically a layer of fat. Soap breaks that fat apart and leaves it unable to infect you. It also makes your hands slippery and with the mechanical motions of washing, viruses are ripped away. To do it properly, wash your hands as if you've just cut up some jalapenos and want to put in your contacts next. The next thing is social distancing, which is not a nice experience, but a nice thing to do. This means no hugging, no handshakes. If you can stay at home, stay at home to protect those who need to be out for society to function, from doctors to cashiers or police officers. You depend on all of them. They all depend on you to not get sick. On a larger level, there are quarantines, which can mean different things from travel restrictions or actual orders to stay at home. Quarantines are not great to experience and certainly not popular, but they buy us and especially the researchers working on medication and vaccination crucial time. So if you are put under quarantine, you should understand why and respect it. None of this is fun, but looking at the big picture, it is a really small price to pay. The question of how pandemics end depends on how they start. If they start fast with a steep slope, they end badly. If they start slow with a not so steep slope, they end okayish. And in this day and age, it really is in all of our hands, literally and figuratively. A huge thanks to the experts who helped us on short notice with this video, especially our world in data the online publication for research and data on the world's largest problems and how to make progress solving them. Check out their site. It also includes a constantly updated page on the corona pandemic. Welcome back. And I know we are being bombarded by information regarding COVID-19, but we need as much information at our fingertips as we possibly can to safeguard ourselves, our family and our nation. Um, I think the one thing that I've also not heard about, and I'm going to put this question to Neil. Neil Butko is a friend of ITV, as you know, Dr. Neil Butko. He is a friend and comes in as and when um, is needed to obviously share very in, in important information with us. This time around, we're going to be looking at COVID-19. We're going to be looking at the psychological implications as far as being holed up together with your loved ones for the next uh, 21 days. How do you set boundaries, the do's and don'ts around a situation like this? Because believe you me, it doesn't matter how much you love each other, you're going to start getting under each other's skin. But before we delve into that, the other issue is COVID-19 and your pets. Neil is, suffers from a condition, uh, retinosa pigmentosa, which means he has very limited sight. So he's very dependent on his guide dog, who's always in studio with us, Tuppence is his name. And I wonder the implications of not only guide dogs, but our pets at home. Neil, have you had any? Good morning, welcome to the program. Thank Thanks, you for Julie. being here. Lovely to be here. Any thoughts on the issue around COVID and our pets? And if we get horribly sick, are we exposing our pets? Um, there's absolutely no chance of us passing it on, um, especially to dogs and cats. There's no evidence at all that it has any kind of har being harbored in, in those type of animals. You know, it came from, we're not entirely sure, but it might have come from a bat or a pangolin. Uh, you know, whose physiology and, and metabolism very, very different and immune system very, very different to dogs and absolutely zero 
cases of COVID in, in dogs or cats. Or other domestic animals. Or other domestic animals, yeah, like cows and sheep and that type of thing, chickens, nothing. So, you know, you've got to understand that these viruses are very host-specific. Yes, it did jump the species barrier, but that was one mutation that had just managed to find a host, and it found a human host. You know, and all of these cases can actually be traced back to uh, you know, patient zero, you know, mm -hmm. what they call R zero. Mm -hmm. And now we're on to about 350,000 cases in, mm -hmm. in the world. Mm -hmm. So you can just see how this pandemic in, what, in th three months has just spread and just accelerated out of control. Will it eventually burn itself out? It will. Um, what? All right, then that being said, and nobody knows when that would no. happen. As you and I sit and speak here, I think scientists around the world are furiously working behind the scenes, trying to develop a vaccine against this pandemic. Um, and perhaps we'll only get the vaccines next season, yes. which means that we've got a long time to wait out. In the meantime, we need to keep ourselves safe. What I want to know is if I come down with COVID-19, I self-quarantine or even go into an IC unit. Once I'm cleared of the, um, the disease and I go out into the world, does that mean I'm safe to go? Am I not perhaps vulnerable of getting another bout of COVID-19? Does it kind of work similar to our seasonal flus? Well, it, uh, you know, the COVID, the um, coronaviruses are viruses that make a lot of bad copies of themselves. That's part of the, the way that they maintain their integrity. So when they are multiplying, you know, which they do in our human cells, they're making copies of themselves, but they're not exact copies all the time. And this is why it's so difficult to make a... Um, vaccination against COVID-19 because you, you get what this, it's called antigenic drift. So the, 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 the virus itself changes slightly and, and very slightly. It's got spike pro, proteins on it that, that change in their makeup. And those are then become new to our immune system. So there is that one thought that, yes, you can be reinfected again because you could be reinfected by another strain. Oh, my that, word. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, so that, there's a possibility there. But what could also be happening, and, and this is also, I suppose, some cause for concern, is that the current way that we test for the virus is called a reverse transcriptase polymerase chain reaction. Okay, it's a big word. What we're looking for is a small fragment of RNA from the virus. And it's the, the fragment of the virus that actually says make copies of me in the virus. And those tests are only about 70% sensitive. That means at least one out of three, you know, could not be trusted. So there's a high rate of false negatives oh. and false positives. So what they're actually thinking is happening sometimes is that when you get tested, so you might be tested positive, 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 negative, negative, positive, okay? It might just be a testing um, uh, event that has gone wrong. You know, for the best tests in the world, you know, should be around 99.9%. If you look at the HIV test for antibodies, they are about 99.9% 99 .9 sensitive and specific. This one, you know, is brand new. And so there are lots of false negatives, lots of false so positives. So lots of trial and error before yeah. we get it right, by which time we know this is now a global pandemic yes. and um, we're just going to have to wait it out and see what happens. Yeah. Um, if the curve does not flatten in 21 days, there's a possibility that we'll be in further, a further stage of lockdown. I don't even want to think about that. Mm -hmm. I don't even want to go there. But let's look at 21 days, and I'm going to now ask you to put on your counsellor's mm -hmm. hat to talk about the issues around mental health and well-being and psychological mm -hmm. matters pertaining to 
the lockdown. We're going to be living with our loved ones. Some of them we get along well with. Let's look at a functional family. <laughs> let's look at a dysfunctional family. Yeah. Do we need to start having conversations about 21 days going ahead? Do we need to have some perhaps some sort of structure in terms of how we're going to fill the time? Mm. We don't want to get under each other's feet because uh, it could explode and we could have serious breakdowns in mm. family, even if this is a functional family or a dysfunctional family. Yeah. What needs to happen now from a counsellor's point of view? I think you're absolutely right. I think what we need to do is we need to have ground rules because you're living in a very close environment. And yes, we are very much social beings. We can't, you know, we don't do very well when we isolate it from each other. But I think what's going to happen, and every th family that is quarantined together needs to have this discussion about how am I going to interact with everybody in my house and what is my boundaries and what is your boundaries? What can I expect from you? What can I expect from myself? What must I bring to this whole thing? And what must you bring in order to make sure that we have some kind of interaction, but also have a safe distance between us. I mean, they, they're talking about social distancing of about two meters. That's about six foot. So that's about the, you know, the space between us. That's about right. Um, you know, but, but we have a, a strong need for human touch, for, you know, for, for being hugged, for, you know, for all of those type of things. And it's going to be very, very difficult. Now, going to despite have to those needs, we also need our space, so to speak. Yeah. And we need to then as families, I think families need to sit down and talk about ground rules and boundaries and um, time out. Correct. Obviously, you're going mm. to need time out as well. And, um, and I think it's rather do it now then wait till later when you have a blowout in the family. Uh, absolutely. You know, I think, I mean, if we were counsellors in this family scenario, I mean, we would say exactly that. You know, where's your little happy place that you can just go and just be yourself without any kind of intrusion or anything like that? And just to sort of regroup and to find your energy anew, you know, because I think also, I mean, besides just being humans that, that like social content, contact, we also need new stimulation. So, you know, there's a place in our brain that, that works on reward. And what it's looking for is new things all the time, a little bit. And from that, it's getting a little bit of dopamine every single time. And we absolutely addict, I mean, not just addicted, we absolutely need that. I mean, it, it's like food and water. And also, possibly work out a timetable of what you're going to do every day or a couple of hours of the day to keep yourself occupied. Sure. Otherwise, you're going to be really going crazy in this confined space. Yeah. Um, maybe, you know, spring clean, uh, take out a couple of books, do your mm. reading. Uh, maybe you want to go into treat this as a spiritual retreat, which you could do, mm -hmm. lots of introspection, but you can't do it all of the time. So you need to work out a timetable so that you don't go mad mm. during this period. Mm. What about if you have a loved one who has a mental problem, a mental disease? It may be borderline personality order, mm. it might be um, uh, it might be bipolar disorder, sure. any one of those things. How do you communicate the information to them and how do you work around them because if you don't meet their needs there can be a terrible meltdown in that situation. Absolutely I mean at the best of times they're quite fragile and they're quite vulnerable so how do we actually give them the maximum amount of understanding and uh, capacity for love without you know also you know trying to patronize them or to take control of their lives. Because I think that's also the thing, Julie, is that people want to have some control over their lives. You know, so you can't, I mean, you can't take away complete control altogether. Otherwise, you know, society will just break down altogether. So, you know, I think being cognizant of the fact that they've got this mental illness 
I think one of the most important things is that whatever medication they're on, they must continue. I mean, absolutely no doubt. And if there is any kind of breakthrough of symptoms or whatever, that they immediately go to their psychiatrist or, you know, or psychologist, probably psychiatrist, you know, to make sure that, they, that the medication is correct. Because you don't want people to unravel under these circumstances. And also, I should imagine that very especially with people with a mental um, disease is structure and routine mm. needs mm. to be adhered to as strictly as you possibly mm. can, because otherwise they are they're going to kind of almost lose control. Mm. They're not going to know when, how to, to, to contain themselves, so to speak. Yeah. That's, I, that's crucial, is it not? It is, because they, they don't have a good sense of self. So the, their own sort of personal awareness is quite sort of low and marginal. So they're going to really, really struggle because, you know, for them to be internalized, you know, it, you know already they're suffering from that and they're suffering from, like, from poor thoughts or delusions or something like that. If they're schizophrenic or bipolar, they've got grandiosity, you know, and all the other things. So now we're asking them even to be even more sort of introspective. And it's going to be very difficult. Just thinking about that, I, I think people should also have space and time to like make their thoughts known. Is it talking to someone on WhatsApp calling? Is it talking on Facebook or, you know, or is it talking on Zoom or something? Or is it just journaling or talking to somebody else overseas or, or something like that? But making a true connection, I think, is going to be very important. And I would really, really stay away from the gaming. I, I know it's going to be hard to because it's a way of passing the time. And, you know, it's a way of using that time in, in a very self-indulgent but a very negative type of way. Neil, you, are, you have been a counsellor at Lifeline yes. for over 20 years now. And what I'm also thinking in terms of regular people, people who don't have mental health mm. issues, but we also go through you know, highs and lows, there are times we feel sad, there are times we feel mm. quite depressed, quite sad, mm. and we just need a, a good cry or, or you need a shoulder to, to, to lean on. How do we manage that, number one? And will Lifeline be available for those people who are in a very, very dark place during this lockdown period, just to talk them through uh, this dark period, Lifeline and SADC for that matter? Yeah. I mean, I think SADC offers, um, offers a different type of service. So it's not exactly the same. They, get, they are more of a referral service, which, which I think is also important at this time because mental health issues are going to be exaggerated right now. Lifeline, unfortunately, we've had to close our offices and we can't be doing any face-to-faces for the, the next 21 days. But we do have a WhatsApp line. I'm just not sure what it is at the moment, but you can Google it. And we will speak to clients on a, on a WhatsApp phone because the data is relatively cheap and you know we don't need to spend a lot of money on on an actual phone and what the capacity there is that not only will you have one session but you can have up to four sessions with a counselor and obviously what we're trying to also maintain is to maintain that relationship between the counselor and the client as far as possible so you will hopefully have the same <clears throat> Uh, counselor for those four sessions and then you can really see some kind of progression so you know we welcome people to actually phone in or whatsapp us and to set up some kind of appointment and it it is an appointment that you know we we're going to have to have a little bit of your details we're going to have to have a connection number and we're going to have to do it that way so you know that that is going to be a service that we are maintaining and we've got a lot of dedicated counsellors that are happy to do that type of thing. With two minutes to wrap up time, Neil, okay. um, I'm already just thinking about the lockdown, already feeling, um, I'm already hyperventilating. 
<laughs> Anxiety is normal. Absolutely. Julie. Yeah, absolutely. Um, what are we going to, you know, what do you want to share with our viewers this morning regarding anxiety, regarding cabin fever? Sure. When you find yourself in a situation like that during the 21 days, what's the best thing to do? I think, I, I think you need to reach out. You need to reach out to those around you as soon as possible. And really to be open with your, with your fears and your anxieties. Like, you know, how long is this going to go on for? We all need support and need love. And we're going to be dependent on what we call strokes. People telling us, you do, you're going to be okay. And I think that also another way that we're going to actually cope with this whole thing is what they do in like Alcoholic Anonymous um, fellowships is one day at a time. Right. If we look too far into the future, yes, we're doing this because of the future, but let's just take it one day at a time. And, and with that type of mantra, it makes it much, much easier to actually cope on a daily basis. A lot of people are thinking that this is a great stay at home holiday break from the horrible boss, a break <laughs> from, you know, hard work, etc. But the reality is going to kick in at some point, Definitely. maybe after mm. week one, maybe after three days mm. or whatever. Just keep an open mind, keep a clear mind, remember the boundaries, not to cross them as far as your loved ones are concerned. And if you're fortunate enough to be living um, in a home with a garden, then go out into the garden as much as you possibly yeah. can. And, 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 and I, I suppose very important is physical exercise. Very important. It's stay away from alcohol and smoking. Very good indication that especially in China, with a very high rate of smoking, the um, uh, death rate, the mortality rate was up to 10% in smokers, diabetics, cardiovascular patients. So whatever other kind of comorbid condition you've got, make sure that it's well treated, your nutrition is normal, you know, and that type of thing. And that's where we leave it. Thank you indeed for being with us. Pleasure. There you have it, uh, a scientist, Dr. Neil Butko. He lectures in pharmacology at Wits University, just giving you another dimension to the issue that we're faced with at the moment, and that, of course, is COVID-19. Alhamdulillah here at ITV Networks, we are very socially aware, very socially responsible, and thus we are bringing you as much information as we possibly can as how we can get through the next 21 days as far as lockdown is concerned. Welcome back, and my next guest is uh, Quraysh Isaacs. He's here to talk to us about coaching, the type of work he's been involved in in the community, and also coaching as a means to rehabilitation. We do know that we have a huge problem in our community, and globally, I guess, regarding addiction. So what is the work that Quraysh and his team are doing? A little while ago, um, I came across uh, something on one of my um, WhatsApp groups, and um, Quraysh and his team were offering free coaching sessions in the Auckland Park area. And I kind of wondered if this was a joke because I know coaching is expensive. Going on a coaching course, etc., is expensive. And I thought, well, whoever this is has a heart of gold for wanting to touch the community in this way. So let me introduce you to the man and let's hear what this is all about. Salaamu Alaikum, welcome to the program. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. Thank you for this wonderful opportunity. My pleasure entirely. And I must say it all stems from that one advert that went out on social media that uh, you guys were offering free coaching. And I kind of wondered why, because there's no such a thing as a free lunch. <laughs> um, obviously, it's about upliftment of the community, yeah. is it not? Absolutely. We've started this coaching um, and I've never looked at it that, it that it's free. I thought, you know, we're serving a community that, you know, that is in poverty and, uh, and, and people wouldn't want to pay for it. So we started this need. Uh, it started as a need uh, and we busy with this project probably for about seven years now. We've had free coaching ever since we started. We still try and engage communities and individuals. Individuals will phone up and say, you know, I need, I need a coaching session, or my child is in addiction, can you assist me? 
Um, so uh, we've, we've actually, in that area, uh, ensure that we serve the community and we've expanded. We started in Nuclear in Westbury, worked there for a couple of years and we moved to El Dorado Park. Currently I have a group in Rustenburg and I'm also uh, with a group of coaches that I'm training now in Gelukstal, of all wow. places. Okay. It's in, uh, in the East Prakpan uh, uh, area. Uh, so it's exciting and then now we're back we've got a group a wednesday night group in auckland park uh, it's a huge not huge but a relatively big group about 25 people that we're currently uh, coaching uh, but we we're not training them some of our coaching is training coaches people to become coaches some become recovery coaches and some we just coach them you know so you've, you've talked about three categories here. You're talking about um, some of them to become coaches themselves and then specifically recovery coaches, which is sorely needed in the community. And then someone that just comes to learn what coaching is all about. What benefit is it to that person? Uh, the third category, the, the benefit of that is that you have somebody that you can uh, engage with. Uh, coaching, maybe I can just explain what coaching is. Coaching is a, um, it's a professional uh, um, engagement with one person uh, where you listen to the person, you look at that person's agenda, uh, you, you put your own uh, values on hold, you, you know, you sort No of, judgment. Yeah, you, You're just hearing what he or she correct. is all about. You put your judgment aside and you listen to the person and what that person is. So the coaches are trained to, to listen. You know? So we listen very closely, we listen very attentively, we listen very deeply. There are three levels of, of listening. So we listen at level three. We listen for values, li you listen for those things that are not said. You know, and, 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 and that's for me always, you know, when you start listening and people talk, 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 uh, they give you information, they give you, but in that information, the coach will sort of sift through what, what is this person actually saying? What is this person crying out for? An example, if, if you ask somebody for, uh, now in this, in, this, in this time about COVID, you know, what is, what is freaking you out? What is making you to worry? The person would say something like, uh, you know, I'm, I'm scared. So for, the, for you, it means the other person is scared. But for a coach, it means there's something more. That person is, what's going to happen? I might die. Uh, you know, who's going to take care of my kids? Uh, you know, I'm, I don't have the finances. So we're looking at those things and we try and coach the person at, the, at that level so that the person can start dealing with, 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 with these things uh, much better. Um, we also find that um, there's a host of topics that we, that we coach in, you know, everyday coaching, uh, everyday topics, sorry, um, things like relationships. We coach relationships because that's a major issue in, 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 our, in our community. But we also found that a lot of Muslim people are very sort of reluctant to come for coaching. You know, it's like, what is this? This is foreign, you know, we don't, we don't do these things. But the Either ones... Either that <coughs> or the fact that um, other people in the community is going to know their business. Okay, so, so coaching, uh, what we, we have something that we call a container. So we always say this phrase that uh, coaching is confidential. Whatever is said in this room, it's not like this room here. Yeah? Everybody will know what <laughs> we're talking about. Everything that is said in the container remains in the container. So there is confidentiality and people, funny enough, they adhere to that. Because it's, it's, when somebody speaks, it's also that I'm ready to share. That's a phrase that we use. We don't just tell, tell me what's happening in your life. You will share when you're comfortable in sharing. And that's sort of a key thing. So when you're very comfortable to share with other people that you don't know. And, and funny enough, in coaching, and especially in group coaching, you find that people share with strangers, people they don't know. It's very difficult to share with your own family. You know? And we also say in coaching, we don't coach family. You know, that's, that's a big no-no. We coach people that we, because it becomes easy. If my son has a problem, I wouldn't coach my son. I would refer him to somebody else. Because you can't be objective, obviously. You can't be objective. It's too close to home. Absolutely. Um, 
your journey into coaching, and I want to come back and talk about um, addiction coaching. That's a new concept to yeah. me, and we know it's a huge problem in the community. Let's try and talk about that. And then also people that you uh, coach to go on to become coaches themselves. What are they putting back into the community? I love that concept. Yeah. You and I spoke about it on another platform. But who are you and why the interest in coaching and why the putting back into the community? Why paying it forward? Alhamdulillah. Okay, okay. I, I think that has been my journey since I've been become a teacher and I was teaching at the madrasa for 10 years. Sure uh, I've always been in that, in that field. And I was also fortunate when I started working in, in the city of Joburg, um, my work is also civic education and engaging with communities. So I've got this passion for, for people. So um, where did my journey start with, with coaching? Um, I think uh, with the recovery coaching, um, I was also affected by family that was in addiction for, and I mean, I was, I didn't know anything about addiction. I didn't know anything about drugs. And, um, and then I started to go and un learn, you know, what this phenomenon is. And my training was about, took me about two years. Sure. Uh, so it was a long, long journey. And also the training that we received from, uh, I need to mention the, this place, the, it's called the Foundation, David Collins. They came into the community and they gave this training free of charge. And he said to us, the only thing you have to do is to take it out. Give it out. Pay it forward. You know, pay it forward. Uh, train other people, you know. And now we've become uh, sort of their, um, their uh, good, good story, you know, uh, that we going to all these communities. And, and, and besides us just coaching, we're also training now. That has become our focus. In fact, that's my passion, is to train other coaches, recovery coaches. There's a slight difference between coaching and recovery coaching. Recovery coaching has got to do with, um, uh, it focuses more on addiction. Okay, so that is a major part of our, of our work currently because, you know, even if somebody's in addiction, one addict can't just help another addict. You have to go through the training. You have to understand addiction. And it's, it's more about moving that person from illness into wellness. And the focus of recovery coaching is about wellness. Is how do you get this person to become part of society, to become accepted into the family, because they go through a lot of trauma. And you need to also understand what, why the person has gone into addiction, because people don't get up in the morning and say, today I'm going to become an addict. There are always factors. And it's, it's, it's interesting when you start unpacking these things. And with the addict, funny enough, addicts are different from ordinary people. You know, we know that they're addicts, so that is already a known fact. So your coaching then becomes much easy, where in a normal person, if you do coaching, you have to sort of delve into it and ask because... This okay, I'm going to ask you to hold that thought okay. and we're going to pick up from where we stop here. Now we need to go for an ad break. Okay. And I'm absolutely fascinated. My guest is Koresh Isaacs. He is a coach. I should imagine he's a master coach by now. Works very, very hard in the community. And as you've heard, they're all around. Wherever the need is, um, Koresh and his team are there. He's going to give us the name once again. And I think there's a link with the Islamic Medical Association as well. So we'll hear about all of that right after the ad break. Koresh Isaacs is my guest. We're talking coaching. And yes, I know we've, we talk very regularly about coaching, all the different modalities, NLP and, um, it, you know, all of the newer uh, modalities that come about. But we're looking at coaching from a very different perspective. Here we're talking to someone who's putting back into the community footprint coaching. And also they're talking recovery coaching. It's the first time I've come across this concept. Let's unpack it a little more. So Koresh, if someone comes to you, someone who is a functional addict, and you know you do have dysfunctional um, and functional addicts. There are those people that go out in the workplace and they're pretty functional, um, but they are, you know, they do use illicit drugs. If they come on recovery coaching, whatever their agenda is, 
Um, most times renal addicts are very manipulative and they'll try and pull the wool over your eyes. But they come on the coaching, what's it going to do for them? Will they be able to then perhaps start rehabilitating? Okay. Um, I think that's a very important question that um, most of our coaches or in, in, in some cases the bulk of the coaches that come are coming from a background of addiction. Okay. And um, but in the addiction, they don't understand addiction itself because they take a substance and they get lost in that substance. So they don't understand the process of addiction. So if you bring me somebody, if you bring me your child is maybe in grade 10 or grade 8, and you say to me, I think my child is using. So, so that's the very first important step. And before parents get to that step, a lot of things happen at home and disbelief and enabling and, and, and a host of other things. So the, the, the first step would be to bring them to us. We would do a test. You know? So we would listen to, to the mom and then we would do a test. Um, we do a, a, a drug test. And then from there, we will then indicate you know, what the results are. And then we look at, there are four steps. We call it when you use drug, we say you mad. U-M-A-D. So the U would be using. So they're just casually using, they're starting out. And that for us is the best uh, place to start when they're just using, you know, the first month. So they're starting to experiment. So the experimenting phase is very, very important. If we can catch them there, uh, you know, we've sort of uh, started. Uh, chances are that you can chances, rehabilitate them and get them off greater, the drugs. Yeah. It's, it's but what about someone that's a young adult or an old, someone in their 40s, 50s have been using for the past so many years? If they come to you for addictions coaching, can they try and get their lives back on track? Yes, definitely. Um, this, uh, uh, recovery coaching focuses on misuse and abuse. So that's the area that we're focusing on. Remember when that person comes in, he's coming in from a, a culture of addiction and we want to move into a culture of wellness. So that is what we, we don't look at the addiction culture. If somebody says, you know, I'm 30 years, I've been using this drug for so, much, for so long, how can you assist me? That is already a start for that person on his recovery because he has come to you. So yes, uh, so we, we, we take him through a process of eight weeks and then uh, most of those people want to help other people as well. So they come and then we put them on, onto this training uh, called recovery coaching training. It's a certified accreditation course that you can do. Um, so just to complete that, so uh, um, abuse and, and misuse, that's the area that we focus on. And then the last stage would be dependent. So somebody come and he gives me a background and says, he's using this, he's doing this and this and then the coach will then immediately place him in those four categories. So if he's there, then we need to refer him if he's dependent. Refer him as into a rehab center. That's correct. Yeah. So okay. that's the fourth phase. That you can't reverse in, a, in this. But if he's using or abusing, that is where, where recovery coach can come and we can assist you as an outpatient. Because now the only thing is when we have a coaching session, it's not just talking, it's about you taking responsibility. And that's the important thing that I like about coaching is that you don't take, uh, I don't take residue, I don't take the issues and I keep it with me. I don't take responsibility. I'm trying in the conversation to give you the responsibility back so that you can take it forward and, and, and deal with it as an individual. But during the coaching session, we give a lot of skills. We give you a toolbox filled with skills on how to cope. We look at what was the issues. We look at how do you, you know, this thing of And this is coaching culture. right across the board. So if I want to come, if I want to join you and do the coaching course and then go out and work in the community coaching young people, uh, will the foundation or fundamentals all be exactly the same, but just tweaked for recovery coaching to um, the other coaching? Or is it all really basically the same? Okay, um, the coaching method, we, we teach you the coaching itself, life coaching, there's business coaching, ah. um, there's, there's recovery coaching. So we teach you all these things, but eventually as a coach, you will then apply the skills that you have as the person sitting in front of you. So ah, you'll okay. be doing, if, a, if there's a relationship coaching or you have to t coach a teenager with behavioral problems, we will give you the necessary skills to be able to deal with that issue. 
uh, recovery coaching is just very specific. You know, you do a test, you look at where the person is, you look at what are the, the, the factors that is making him to do that, and, and then you start transferring skills. It's about getting him into wellness. But the big thing with, with recovery coaching also is that, and this is what a lot of people don't understand, that when you are in recovery, the, it's, 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 it's a graph. It just doesn't just go up. There's a, a place where you also relapse. And this is what we need to, to educate people. And that once you relapse, then it depends on the recovery capital that you have. The recovery capital is those people that's going to support you, like the support groups, you know, hobbies, uh, coaching programs, uh, education about addiction and so on. So as soon as you drop, then you pick up again your recovery capital, you know, your sponsors, they grab you, they talk you through it and they lift you up again and then you become clean again. Okay, so what I really want to get at here, what you're saying is the course is very similar or rather when someone joins you, uh, they go through this eight weeks, you touch on everything, um, you touch on uh, uh, recovery coaching, you touch on uh, relationship coaching, you touch on business coaching, you touch on everything. What if I want to specialize in relationship coaching, for example? Would I go on some extra coaching for that or do I just hone in on that particular area and make that almost my speciality? So that's a good question that the, the, the recovery coaching, we normally uh, do it as a separate because it, it's a structured course. There are three levels of the coaching and then you become a, a recovery coach. With the, the life coaching, that is where your, um, rec uh, um, what, what it, uh, you, you asked now about uh, relationship coaching. Yes. That is where your relationship. So we will give you sufficient skills to deal with relationship. We'll teach you the relationship cycle. Uh, maybe you want to do grief, whatever. So that is the area that we will package uh, in, in the over life the coaching. Over the eight weeks. Over the eight weeks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we will find out from the group, you know, which areas uh, are you there for and what would you. So we would bring those in. But most of the skills are generic, so we will teach you listening skills, for right, example. You right. can use it in anything. Uh, so it's, 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 it's very much packaged in such a way that we, we look at, at the clients and, and what, how you're going to need it. You know? So it's, 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 not, it's not a one foot, here's the, the Okay, material. all right, wonderful. We've almost come to the end of the interview. Oh, that's, <laughs> that went quick. Not enough time. Um, Tell us where and how one then signs up to be, you know, to come on for this coaching and then also be able to go out in the, to, to the community to then pay it forward, so to speak. Okay. And you are footprint coaching, you are an NPL. Yeah. Are there costs involved? I know this last one was offered free and I couldn't believe it, but are there costs involved? No, uh, we've always maintained that uh, if we do the coaching for community people that's going to go back in, in, into training, uh, there's no cost involved. Uh, when we do the, the testing training, there is a cost involved because we need to pay for the tests. Testing? Kits, oh, uh, the, the drug tests. Oh, okay. So we've got a whole course on drug testing because when you do drug testing for kids under 18, you know, um, there's a lot of uh, legal stuff that, that you need to factor in. So we, we do that separately. But basically, Footprints Coaching uh, is there to serve the community. We are there to facilitate training and to make sure that this recovery capital increases. And especially amongst uh, our Muslim people, uh, there's a sort of a reluctance, you know, and we want to sort, and I'm thankful for this opportunity maybe it will reach them and say you know maybe Inshallah. i need to go and maybe I, I don't have to become a coach but let me go and educate myself Absolutely. so i can help my sister child and i can help this one and Absolutely. i can help somebody else so that's the idea of of us being there to serve our our community now i know that i've just missed the opportunity i think you're three weeks in running yeah. at a facility in auckland park doing that's the right. basic coaching course um, and of course, with COVID-19 and the lockdown, everything has come to a standstill. Yeah. When do you pick up again? And when are you offering, um, depending on what happens post-COVID-19, yeah. um, are there other courses that will be offered during the year? And how does one, where do we find all the information okay. on you? What we, what we do is we use social media, basically. That, that's our, our main area of, of advertising. So it will be in the various groups. 
Um, and people, you know, they spread around, but it's, it would be, we were going to finish the, the course that we're busy with now. And maybe after Ramadan, we would, you know, start a, a second one. We normally do it on a, on a Saturday, Saturday mornings, and then uh, in the week would be Wednesday, because the other nights I would, I would coach. Okay, so we just need to go to your social media pages. Yeah. Uh, is it under Footprint Coaching? There's a Footprint, Co Footprint Coaching Facebook page. And we post on, on WhatsApp, and I've got a, a, a website as well. It's called Footprints Coaching Nuclear. That's where we have to leave it. Jazakallah for being with Thank us. You. And I commend you for the amazing work you're doing. Madhla subhanahu wa ta'ala, accept all of your Shukran. efforts and have many, many more people like you going out in the community and making a difference. Thank you. Shukran. That was Quraysh Isaacs talking to us about footprint coaching, and not a moment too soon. And inshallah, post COVID 19 and Ramadan, I certainly am going to join them and then perhaps pay it forward by coaching young people in our communities. On that note then, we've come to the end of the show. All I can say is from the deepest recesses of my heart, I make dua that each and everyone make it through the 21 days of lockdown. It's going to be a trying time for all of us, but let's apply our minds, let us be circumspect, let's introspect, let us become better human beings and allow our loved ones their spaces Stick to a timetable, stick to a routine, make time for exercise, time out. Uh, you know, everything you've always promised yourself that you're going to do around the house, this is the time. Grab it with two hands and make it work for you, for your loved ones, and for South Africa as a whole. Shukran for being with me. Till the next time, is always take care on the roads. And it is Assalamu Alaikum and Khuda Hafez from the bottom of my heart. From me, Julie Ali.